Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you're not going to want to miss it. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the case of Carla Walker. Carla was brutally murdered on February 17th of 1974. When I ran across this case and saw that Carla had died almost 48 years ago exactly, I just felt compelled to talk about this case. And this case really goes to show the advancements in technology. Carla's case is one that was cold for well over 40 years and only recently got solved a little less than two years ago. So with that being said, said, let's jump right on into it today. Carla Walker was born on January 31st, 1957 in Fort Worth, Texas to her parents, Leighton Walker and Doris Walker, and Carla was one of five siblings. Growing up, Carla wanted to become a veterinarian, and her family described her as being tiny but mighty. She was 4 foot 11 and around 100 pounds, so she was pretty little. She's described as being sweet and loving, but also someone who was a spitfire and definitely could be a little stubborn at times. Carla was absolutely beautiful. At the time of her death, she was a junior in high school attending Western Hills High School in Fort Worth, Texas. And for all things considered, Carla basically lived everyone's idea of what the it girl looked like in high school. She was a cheerleader. She was beautiful. She was popular. She had a car. And she also was dating the star quarterback of the football team, who was a boy named Rodney McCoy. Now, Rodney was a senior and Carla was a junior, like I said, and they were pretty much known from everyone in the school as being the it couple. I mean, you had the quarterback and the cheerleader. It really doesn't get more stereotypical than that. But regardless of the image, quote unquote, that they had throughout their school, Carla and Rodney were really serious about each other. Just a couple months before Carla's death, Rodney actually gave Carla a promise ring. And for him, that was his way of telling her that he was there to stay and that he was there for the long haul. And if you live in Texas, high school football is kind of a religion, so to speak, you know? Every Friday night, teachers, parents, students, alumni, friends, family would all gather to the football field to watch the football games. And you had Carla in the sidelines cheering and you had Rodney out on the field being the star quarterback that he was. And again, it was just very picturesque and very idyllic. And while I do want to point out that it's not everyone's ideal, you know, high school experience to have that, it was very movie-esque, so to speak. Now, in 1974, when Carla was a junior in high school, like I said, Western Hill High School put together a Valentine's Day dance. Now, according to the students who went to this dance, this dance was a big deal. It was a time where you could take your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your crush or anyone of that nature to do something special on Valentine's Day, even at a young age. Because when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, really, there's not much you can do on Valentine's Day. Your options are kind of limited. So all the students were really excited about this dance, and that included Carla and Rodney. The dance was being held on February 17th, 1974, so just three days after Valentine's Day, and of course, Rodney and Carla were planning on attending the dance together. On the day of the dance, February 17th, Rodney went to work, which he worked at the local gas station, and once he got off of work, he drove home to get ready. And once he got ready, Rodney's mom actually let him borrow her car for the night, which was a Ford LTD. And once Rodney got in the car, he was on his way. Now, another little just tidbit in all of this is while Rodney was driving over to Carla's, he actually forgot 
the corsage, which if you don't know, it's that flower that you put on your date's wrist or your date's tux or suit or whatever. I never got asked to prom, so I really don't know, but I do know that it's a flower. And while Rodney was on his way over to Carla's, he remembered that he forgot the corsage and he was already kind of running tight on time, but he knew that he could not go to this dance with Carla without giving her a corsage. So he turned his car all the way around, went back, grabbed the corsage and went back to Carla's. Carla's house. And at this point he was running late and Carla was not so happy with him. However, Rodney says that the second that he put the corsage on her and they started taking pictures, she was happy as could be. Now, Rodney and Carla had plans to go to dinner together before attending the dance. So they were going to go to do dinner and then the dance together. It's not... Back then, it wasn't really like how it is now. I don't know about your guys' experiences in high school, but for mine, it wasn't really, you know, you would go off and get dinner with your dates. It was, we all met up in a big group and did group pictures and things like that. And then we went off. No one really did anything separately as a couple. However, for this one, Rodney and Carla decided that they were going to go get dinner first, and then they were going to go to the dance. The school had decorated the cafeteria in all pink and red decorations, and they even had a theme to the dance, which was love is a kaleidoscope. And at the dance, Carla and Rodney's friends said that the couple seemed as happy as ever. The two of them spent the night dancing on the dance floor, taking pictures with their friends, and just enjoying the night together. Really, everything seemed perfectly fine until it wasn't. Now at around 1 a.m., Carla's older sister Cindy and her younger brother Jim were sitting in the living room of their house that Carla also lived in and they were just watching TV when all of a sudden they heard Rodney's car make a quick tight turn and hit a curb and quickly drove into their driveway. They then heard Rodney jump out of the car screaming, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker over and over again, which was obviously Carla's dad, before he began banging on the door. Cindy and Jim answered the door to a completely frantic Rodney and the first thing that they noticed is Rodney had blood all over him. He also had a cut down the right side of his face and he had blood all over his shirt. Now Cindy got her parents and when they asked him where Carla was, all Rodney kept saying was, they've got her. They've got her. They took her. We need to find her. Now, the family immediately called 911, but before police could even arrive, Layton, Carla's father, actually walked out of the door with a pistol in his hand, heading towards the bowling alley that Rodney said the two of them were at when all of this happened. So I know you're now wondering, how in the world did we get from the two of them having the time of their lives? at a Valentine's Day high school dance to now Rodney looking like he had been attacked and Carla nowhere to be found. So let's talk about how we got there. Now, once the dance was over, Rodney and Carla decided that they were going to leave and go to their local Taco Bell. Now, this was kind of the high school hangout spot on Friday and Saturday nights, and Rodney invited another couple to join with them. So it was the four of them together, and they got in the car, and they went to Taco Bell and hung around there until a little bit past midnight. After going to Taco Bell, Rodney dropped off the other couple and it was just him and Carla at that point. And they were kind of in this euphoric state where they didn't want the night to end. So they just kind of kept driving around and talking and hanging out. And at some point, Carla had to go to the bathroom. So they decided to pull off at the best place that they could find, which was the local bowling alley. Carla got out of the car, walked into the bowling alley, used the restroom, and came back into the car with Rodney. Now, obviously, Rodney and Carla at this point are teenagers in high school who are now away from their parents. They're alone. They're dating. And the two of them started kissing and making out and doing things that they couldn't normally do at each other's houses because their parents were home. Now, Rodney said that with the way that they were positioned, Carla was in the passenger seat and Rodney was in the driver's seat. Obviously, it was his car. He was driving. Carla was positioned on her back, so her back was on the seat 
of the passenger seat, if that makes sense. So she was lying down on the passenger seat and her head was on the door handle of the passenger seat on the inside of the car. And she had used her purse to kind of place it behind her head, almost to use it as a pillow. Now, according to Rodney, the two of them were, you know, getting into it when all of a sudden someone had come up to their car and opened the passenger car door, which basically resulted in both of their heads kind of jolting out of the car. Rodney said a man had opened the car door and pistol whipped Rodney in the face, which was why he had a cut down the side of his face. After being pistol whipped multiple times by this man, Rodney was pretty out of it, but he does remember that after being pistol whipped, the man pointed the gun at his face and pulled the trigger about three times. However, the gun never actually fired. Now, while all of this was going on, Rodney said that he could feel Carla shaking from fear underneath him and she was screaming, don't hurt us, don't kill us. However, that did not stop the man from attacking Rodney, but Rodney was obviously not this man's main target. He just kind of wanted to get Rodney out of it enough where it would be easy to take Carla away. And that is exactly what he did. After hitting Rodney over the head multiple times, the man was able to grab Carla from underneath Rodney and pull her out of the car while simultaneously continuing to hit Rodney with the pistol. Once Carla was out of the car and saw that the man kept hitting Rodney, she screamed at him and told him to stop hurting him and that she would go with him. And that is exactly what ended up happening. Before we move any further, I want to take a quick ad break and thank our sponsors for today's video. Does this happen in your house? Every time you ask your kids how school was, even if they answer, they just end up mumbling, fine. I can think of so many times I've asked my nieces and nephews and cousins that question, and even if they answer, it's nothing of any substance. So I was trying to figure out what excites them, what they're really interested in learning, and that is when I discovered OutSchool. OutSchool offers the largest variety of live interactive online classes for kids pre-K through high school, and the classes are actually fun. They cover every interest you can think of and some you probably even couldn't think of if you tried like video game design cartoon animation playing an instrument speaking a language creative writing and so much more and the classes are super affordable you can choose the size and group that works best for your child by giving them the experience that's best for them and out school even has one-on-one -on -one classes out school has helped kids get excited about learning and they can help yours too to learn more about out school and all it has to offer and to save $15 off your child's first class, go to outschool.com slash instinct and use code instinct. That's code instinct at O-U-T-S-C-H-O-O-L dot com slash instinct to save $15 off your child's first class. Outschool.com slash instinct. Now's the time to set yourself up for a better and brighter year. Everly Well can help you give yourself more clarity, confidence, and well-being with over 30 at-home lab tests. Everly Well at-home lab tests give you physician-reviewed results and personalized insights so you can take action on your health and wellness, all at an affordable and transparent cost. With over 30 tests, you'll be able to choose the ones that make the most sense for you. Food sensitivity, metabolism, sleep and stress, and thyroid are just a few of the many options. Options. Really Well ships your at-home lab test straight to you with everything you need for a simple sample collection. And then after that, using the prepaid shipping label, you just mail your test back to a certified lab. And in just days, your physician reviewed results and actionable insights are sent to your device. And even better, you can share the results with your primary care physician to help guide next steps. I chose to try out the sleep and stress test from Everly Well. I'm still waiting to get my results back, but the process of doing the test in and of itself was so simple and so easy and I chose that test because I obviously have problems with sleep and stress. So I'm really excited to see what it says. And for listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off at home lab tests at everlywell.com slash killer. That's everlywell.com slash killer for 20% off your at home lab test. Everlywell.com slash killer. From head to toe, your body is made up of trillions of cells, which are busy performing their specific functions to keep you healthy and resilient. 
And to keep up with all of the work, a sufficient supply of an essential molecule called NAD plus must be maintained for cells to perform their normal functions, which include creating ATP for cellular energy, repairing your cells, and supporting healthy mitochondria. There are many common lifestyle factors that can decrease your cells NAD plus supply, including alcohol consumption, excess sun exposure, a poor diet, and even environmental factors such as pollution. True Niagen is a supplement that gives your cells what they need. It addresses the non-visible signs of aging like cellular energy production and helps support heart and muscle health. Backed by science, True Niagen is one of the most well-researched patented supplements because it has been researched by some of the top scientific institutions in the world. Since taking True Niagen, I feel at peace knowing it is researched by the top scientific institutions in the world. And right now, new customers can save 20% off their first purchase by going to trueniagen.com slash killer and use the code killer. That's T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N.com slash killer, code killer to save 20% off your first purchase. Trueniagen.com slash killer, code killer. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and this product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now, Rodney wasn't able to say much about the attack. He said it happened very quickly. It all was a blur to him. However, what he was able to say was that he did not know the attacker. He really didn't get a great look at him and wasn't able to fill out a description. But what he did know is that this was a stranger to him and someone that he had never seen before. And along with that, it didn't seem like Carla knew this person either. Rodney said that once Carla was being dragged off by their attacker, Carla looked back at Rodney and screamed to him to go get her dad. But before he could do that, Rodney actually kind of fell unconscious for about five minutes before he woke up out of that state and drove directly to the Walker's house, which was about a mile away. And like I said, when he got there and told Carla's parents what had happened, Carla's dad did not wait for authorities to arrive and he went straight down to the bowling alley, hoping that maybe Carla was there. However, she was not. Carla's family said in the days after Carla's disappearance, they were very heavy and intense. The FBI, the Fort Worth police, everyone was coming in and out of the house trying to do whatever they could to find Carla. And police searched everywhere and questioned just about everyone. They questioned family, they questioned her friends, they questioned Rodney, they looked all through town. They went back to the bowling alley on the night of the attack, and the only thing that they found was Carla's purse. And during the days after Carla's disappearance, when everyone was still trying to find her, Rodney was actually staying at Carla's house in Carla's bedroom, just hoping and wishing that she would come back safely. However, three days after she went missing on February 20th of 1974, Carla was found. Carla's body was found in a culvert, which if you don't know, is basically a tunnel that looks like one big open drain. That's purpose is to carry a stream or a little bit of water. Sometimes it's a big pipe and other times it's actually a tunnel. And in Carla's case, it was a tunnel. This specific culvert was about 30 feet long and just tall enough for the average sized person to stand up straight in. By the condition of Carla's body, police could tell that Carla definitely put up a fight. She had cuts on her legs, her clothes were torn, and she had bruising on her neck. The medical examiner concluded that Carla's cause of death was strangulation and also concluded that Carla had been sexually assaulted. Her family was notified by authorities and brought down to the morgue where they, in fact, did confirm that the body was their daughter, Carla Walker. Now let's talk about where Carla's body was location-wise. Like I said, it was in a culvert, but Carla's body was found near Lake Benbrook. 
Lake Benbrook is about 30 minutes outside of Fort Worth, Texas, and it's definitely more country and less city. And police said that it's very rare that people will drive through the area that Carla's body was found in just to drive there. The reason they would drive there is because they either live there or they're visiting the lake itself, whether they're going towards the lake or leaving the lake. However, this was February and it's pretty rare that people would go and visit the lake due to the colder weather conditions. Where Carla's body was in that culvert was about nine miles from where the bowling alley that she was taken from was, and the culvert itself is pretty difficult to see. You can't just see it on the side of the road when you're driving by, so it's definitely something that you would have to know was there. Now, when it comes to the investigation, you have to remember that this is 1974, and at this time, DNA testing and DNA technology was not invented yet, so authorities had to resort to something different, and what they ended up resorting to was hypnosis. Police brought in a hypnotist to hypnotize Rodney in hopes that he would be able to remember more than he was initially saying, because like I said earlier, he really didn't remember a lot in the beginning and that obviously made everything a lot more difficult for authorities because they had nothing to go off of. So they brought in a hypnotist to see if that could help. And even the detective said that they were very, very skeptical about the hypnotist. However, when they got in there with Rodney and Rodney was under hypnosis, he was able to recall the entire scene. He told police how the man opened the door when him and Carla were lying down and held a gun to his face. He told them how the man grabbed Carla by the arm and dragged her away. And this time he was actually also able to give a brief description of the man. He described this man as a white male with short hair and a skinny nose. And he also said that the man was wearing a green sleeveless jacket, so a vest essentially, and was also wearing a cowboy hat and spoke like a cowboy and when asked what he meant by spoke by a cowboy Rodney said that he just had a very prominent southern accent however they were in Texas so that didn't really give them too much to work with but along with that, the annual rodeo was actually in town in Fort Worth around this time. The rodeo came into town every January and every February of each year. So because of that, the rodeo was in town during this time. So police took this as an opportunity to go and speak to pretty much everyone and anyone who was either involved in the rodeo, meaning working the rodeo, or if they were just at the rodeo as an audience member. They were talking to every everyone. Now, police also looked at Rodney as a plausible suspect here, and I think it's very easy to understand why. He was the last known person to have seen Carla. He had visible injuries on his face, and he really couldn't recall what exactly happened that night. His story was very blurry, and it didn't really have a lot of details. So because of all of that, police thought it was very possible that he himself could have been the one responsible for this. Police questioned Rodney multiple times, multiple different detectives questioned him, trying to see if he would slip up in his story somewhere, but Rodney's family and friends, and even Carla's family, were pretty adamant that they did not believe that Rodney would be capable of something like this. Carla's family basically considered Rodney family, and they really didn't think that he would do this to Carla. He absolutely loved Carla. and. And everyone who was with them that night, even the couple that they were with at Taco Bell before Rodney dropped the two of them off, they said that Rodney and Carla were perfectly fine that night and they were happy, they weren't arguing. There was nothing that would have suggested that Rodney would have snapped and had done something like this. But there were a couple red flags in Rodney's stories. For example, when Rodney went to the Walker's house and kept repeating over and over, they've got 
Carla, they obviously insinuate, the word they obviously insinuates that there was more than one person involved. However, when it came down to it, Rodney said that there was only one attacker. And if there was only one attacker, why would you say they? Why wouldn't you say this person got her or this guy got her or a man got her or someone got her? Why would you say they? Now, at that point, you're really getting down to the technicality of it all. However, in cases like this, you kind of have to. Along with that, another red flag was the fact that Rodney never actually went to the police station after the attack. He went to Carla's house instead. And the issue that a lot of people have is your girlfriend just got kidnapped. Why would you not go to the police station instead of going to her house? Now, the reason that Rodney said that he did this is because the police station was about 30 to 45 minutes away from the bowling alley that they were at, while in comparison to Carla's house, which was only about a mile drive. And along with that, Carla specifically said to go get her dad and her dad was a mile away at the house. So that is why he said that he went to the house first instead of going to the police station. Now, I mentioned earlier that at the crime scene, the parking lot of the bowling alley, Carla's purse was found there. However, that was not the only thing that was found at the crime scene. There was also a magazine from a pistol found nearby her purse. The pistol was a Ruger pistol and police knew that if Rodney had been hit over the head with the gun, the magazine could have easily fallen out. So the fact that they found the magazine of the pistol, it kind of cooperated with Rodney's story because they knew that the magazine could have fallen out if Rodney had been pistol whipped as he said he did. So because they were able to track the type of pistol that it was, again, it was a Ruger pistol, police then went and searched everyone in that area who had purchased that specific pistol. And they ended up narrowing that number down to 40 people. And 40 people is not that many people to have to go and talk to. When you're looking at going from, you know, looking at the entire Fort Worth area and not having anywhere to start, now you're narrowing it down to 40 people. And police then took those 40 people and went and spoke with every single one of them. And they actually ended up asking about 20 of them, so about half of those people to take a polygraph test. And everyone who took a polygraph test passed the polygraph test. So with that all being done now, they kind of were back at square one. They were able to eliminate 40 people, but now they kind of had more questions than they did answers. Now we can't get through this case without discussing the different people that tried to take credit for Carla's death. And one of those people is a man named Tommy Neeland. Tommy was a convicted serial killer who was arrested two months after Carla's murder for a different crime, and police thought that he could have been responsible for Carla. They ended up putting him in a lineup and asked Rodney to see if he could pick out Carla's attacker from that lineup, and Rodney did actually pick Tommy out of the lineup. However, Tommy confessed to every single murder that he was responsible for, and he did not take credit for Carla's. So after looking through everything with him, police put him to the side and decided that he was probably not their guy. Then three years after Carla's murder is when we are introduced to a man named Jimmy Sasser. Now in 1977, Jimmy walked into a police station near Nashville, Tennessee and told them that he was the one that was responsible for murdering Carla. However, once police started to talk to Jimmy, they realized this was not their guy either. Police said that at that point, three years later, newspapers and media were already all so saturated with this case. So it wasn't unlikely that someone could pick up details and kind of, you know, form their own story of what had happened just because there's already so much information out there in the public. Along with that, Jimmy's mom actually came forward and said that this was something that Jimmy did quite often. Oftentimes he would get drunk and would claim to be responsible for different crime cases and murder cases that he actually had nothing to do with. And, you know, that's a whole different, really weird thing to do. But regardless of that, police were able to figure out very quickly that he was not their guy either. So again, back at square one. 
Now, unfortunately, both of Carla's parents passed away before her case was able to be solved. Her father died in 1987 and her mother died shortly after that. And her younger brother, Jim, actually ended up moving back into the house because her parents never left the house that they grew up in, in the hopes that, you know, someday someone would come and kind of take accountability and responsibility for what they did to Carla. And once Carla's parents passed away, Jim basically took on that responsibility and moved into the house hoping that someone would wake up with a guilty conscience and show up on their doorstep and admit to what they had done. So now we fast forward to January of 2018. So really not that long ago when you think about it, just about four years ago. And at this point, Jim, Carla's brother, who has always been very active in this case, always been keeping up with it, always wanting justice and the truth of what happened to Carla, he ended up contacting the Fort Worth Police Department and got in touch with the detectives and basically pleaded with them to look at Carla's case again. Because at this point, so much time had passed Carla, for lack of a better word, was really just a folder in the cold case room. And Jim wanted the truth and he wanted answers. And detectives said that they would do everything that they could to try and find the truth for their family. Because at this point, obviously over 40 years have passed. So So there is a new set of detectives, a new set of eyes that are now looking at this case. And detectives put their heads together and really started from the beginning, trying to come up with a whole new list of possible suspects. And this list of possible suspects that the new detectives came up with actually had 83 names on it. This list included ex-boyfriends of Carl, male friends of Carl, all of it. Everyone and anyone who could have possibly been involved or possibly have a motive, their name was on that list. And detectives interviewed as many of them as they could. And they also got DNA from anyone who agreed to give it over to them as well. And in April of 2019, they posted on the Fort Worth Police Facebook page and they posted about Carla's case, asking that if anyone had any information about it to come forward. And that is when they got a comment from a woman who claimed that she knew exactly who Carla's killer was. So police obviously got in contact with this woman and she told them that the person who killed Carla was actually her ex-husband. The woman claimed that while they were married, she found a metal box of his containing a lot of newspaper clippings just strictly about Carla and the case, which obviously is a little bizarre. And so police decided to bring this man in. And this man is named Stephen Clare. Now, Stephen was 17 years old at the time of Carla's murder. And he also happened to be her neighbor. And even though they weren't best friends, Carla and Stephen were definitely acquaintances. They went to the same school. They definitely knew each other. Carla's brother, Jim, was very familiar with Stephen. And when he was brought into questioning, he was asked about the box. And according to Stephen, he said that this box was just a box of memories from his childhood and they weren't specifically about Carla. While he did admit that he had newspaper clippings of Carla's case in this box, he also claimed that he had other milestones from his parents and his siblings and his friends also in the box as well. And even more than that, Stephen had an alibi. He was actually in Austin, Texas at the time of the murder. So he would not have been able to have commit this. And police did check out his alibi and his alibi was solid. So because of that, he was set clear. Police also took his DNA just to make sure. And again, he was not their guy. So now that leads us to 2019, and this is when a man named Paul Holes, who some of you may be familiar with, comes into the picture. He was previously in law enforcement and now has a true crime show on Oxygen, but he got involved in the Carla Walker case and did an episode on her on his show. Paul's show actually really helped financially have a lot of new testing done in Carla's case. For example, they put up about $18,000 to do some genealogical 
testing with genealogical DNA. And if you don't know what that is, genealogical DNA testing is a type of technology that identifies suspects through their relatives. So it doesn't give you a direct hit on them specifically, but it tells you who they could be related to, which in turn gives you a broader pool to work with in order to ultimately narrow down on your one suspect. And genealogical testing was not available in 2005 when detectives did their original DNA testing. So detectives took all of Carla's clothing and they actually found a perfectly preserved sperm cell on Carla's bra strap. And this, when they found this, they thought they hit the jackpot. They thought this is the perfect sample for testing. This is going to get us a hit. However, when they tested it, nothing came up. And this was heartbreaking for everyone. It was heartbreaking to the family. It was heartbreaking to detectives and for Paul Holes because with DNA, once you use a piece of DNA, it's gone forever. It's not like you can use the same DNA over and over again to continue testing. Once you use a specific piece of DNA, that is the last time you can use it. So you have to be very careful and meticulous about when you choose to use DNA and how you choose to test DNA. So again, with that all happening, they were back at square one again. However, once Carla's episode aired on Paul Hole's show, there was actually a man that contacted Paul and this man was named David Middleman and he was the CEO of a lab called Othram Labs. And Othram Labs specializes in taking degraded DNA samples and creating a DNA profile from them. And lucky enough for everyone who was involved in Carla's case, when they went back to look to see if there was any other DNA samples that they could take from any piece of her clothing, they actually found a degraded DNA sample, again, from Carla's bra strap. And that degraded piece of DNA had the suspect's DNA as well as Carla's DNA. So it was two DNAs mixed together. And in May of 2020, detectives decided to really just take the leap of faith and take the risk. And really the last chance that they saw in finding out who did this because if this didn't work they really didn't know what to do so they sent that degraded sample off to Othram labs and five weeks later they got a phone call on july 4th of 2020 detectives got a call from david middleman who said that they were able to create a genealogical profile and had the name of who they believe could be related to their suspect David had asked the detectives if they had ever heard of a man named Glenn Samuel McCurley. Now, immediately when David told the detectives this, his eyes lit up because he had heard that name before. Glenn Samuel McCurley was actually a name that was on the list of the 83 possible suspects that detectives had come up with. And in fact, Glenn McCurley was number 22 on this list. Along with telling the detectives that they had the guy, Glenn Samuel McCurley, they told authorities that Glenn Samuel McCurley had actually passed away in 1972, which was two years prior to the murder of Carla. So obviously the guy who died in 1972 couldn't have done this. However, that's when detectives asked if Glenn Samuel McCurley had a son named Glenn Samuel McCurley Jr. So detectives went back and looked at their database And that is when they were able to figure out that in fact, Glenn Samuel McCurley had a son named Glenn Samuel McCurley Jr. And this is when they knew they had their guy. Glenn McCurley Jr. was living in Fort Worth, Texas in 1974. And he was actually interviewed in the very beginning of the investigation because he was one of the 40 people that had a Ruger pistol. Remember how we talked about earlier that there was the list of 40 people that they had to go through and 20 of them took polygraphs? Well, Glenn McCurley Jr. was actually one of the 40 they interviewed and one of the 20 that took a polygraph, and he ended up passing the polygraph, which again, just goes to show why polygraph tests are not admissible in a court of law. Now, even in 2020, all of those years later, Glenn McCurley Jr. was still 
living in Fort Worth, Texas, just a couple miles away from that bowling alley. So authorities decided that they were going to go over to Glenn's house. And when they arrived at Glenn's house, at this point, Glenn was about 77 years old. And when they arrived at his house, kind of in a joking way, he threw his hands up and said, I didn't do it just because he saw a police officer and thought that that would be funny. And so he did that. And little did he know what they were actually there for, because when they arrived, the police said that they were just strictly doing a neighborhood welfare check just to kind of feel everything out. And then they left the house. But later that night, they arrived again without Glenn knowing. And they went through Glenn's trash and they were looking for anything that could possibly have his DNA on it. His trash was sent off to DNA labs. And thanks to a McDonald's straw that he had in his trash, the lab was able to confirm that the DNA that was found on Carla's clothing was a match to Glenn McCurley Jr. Once they had that information, detectives went back to Glenn Jr.'s house and brought up the Carla Walker case. And Glenn Jr. said that he had spoken to authorities when the case happened and this, this, and that. And when detectives asked him for his DNA this time in 2020, Glenn was reluctant. He said that they did that back right when this case happened and they already have his DNA and they took it when they initially interviewed him. However, Glenn Jr.'s wife actually was the one that kind of ratted him out in all of this because she jumped into the conversation and said, well, that's not true because they didn't even have DNA technology back then. So no, they didn't get your DNA. So she kind of threw him under the bus on that one. And ultimately he did end up giving over a DNA sample. And again, it was a match. And so now having three different confirmations that the DNA matched Glenn McCurley, detectives knew they finally had their guy. On September 21st of 2020, Glenn McCurley Jr. was arrested for the murder of Carla Walker. And in his interrogation, he confessed. Glenn was 31 years old at the time of Carla's murder. And he said that on that night, he was drunk and quote unquote, just looking for a victim. He admitted to pistol whipping Rodney, but said that he did not rape Carla and that they had consensual sex, which I just want to point out. Carla was a junior in high school. So regardless of if it was consensual sex or not, which as we know, it was not consensual sex. There's no way it was consensual sex. She was kidnapped. Glenn also admitted that he choked Carla to death. And when he did this, he broke down sobbing. Now, at the time of the murder, Glenn actually lived down the street from Carla. However, Carla nor her siblings really knew him directly because again, he was so much older than them. Now, as far as what Glenn was doing at the bowling alley, how he spotted out Carla, we really don't have that information. Glenn never gave that up. And even though he confessed, he actually recanted his confession and pled not guilty. And he ended up going to trial in August of 2021. So quite recently, actually, however, before the jury came to a verdict and before the defense was even able to present their case on the third day of the trial, Glenn Samuel McCurley Jr. ended up pleading guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. Now, I've watched interviews with Carla's family and with Rodney, and they said that after all of this time, you know, finally knowing the truth and finally knowing what happened and finally getting the guy, it was an indescribable feeling for them. And knowing that he is sentenced to life in prison and is going to pay for what he did to Carla, even though it is, you know, so many years later, decades later, Carla still is finally getting the justice that she deserves. And a big question here that a lot of people had, that detectives had, is was this Glenn McCurley Jr.'s first offense because for someone to say that they were just out looking for a victim, that's not something that a one-time offender says. And the fact that he was able to get away with it so seamlessly is also very telling, which granted, again, it was such a different time back then. We did not have the DNA technology that we do now. However, there were multiple other murders that happened in that same area that have led police to believe that this more than likely was not Glenn McCurley's first offense. But with that being said, you guys, I cannot wait to hear what you have to say about this case. And that is going to be all for me today. 
Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and again every Thursday on YouTube and you're not going to want to miss it. I will be back in a couple days with a brand new one and until then, stay safe. Bye guys.